and welcome everyone to this very special evening, a celebration of the life of Audrey Holland, a matriarch in the field of aphasia who's impacted all that we do. So tonight we gather as a community to celebrate and to share and to grieve and to honor. And we do this together as this wonderful aphasia community. We don't know how best to celebrate Audrey, it's pretty hard to capture even an iota of her impact over the course of an evening Zoom call, but we're going to do this in a way that celebrates her rich, robust innovation, and in a way that seems only fitting through stories and anecdotes and reminiscence and relationships. Tonight is a collaboration of five organizations, all of which have been immeasurably impacted by Audrey. The Academy of Aphasia, Academy of Neurogenic Communication Disorders and Sciences, Aphasia Access, the Clinical Aphasiology Conference, and the National Aphasia Association have all worked collaboratively to bring together this amazing evening. I'd like to thank Swathi Kiran, Lynn Marr, Janet Patterson, Sarah Wallace, Maya Henry and Amy Dietz, and Darlene Williamson for their administrative and leadership work in these respective organizations and to bring this evening of sharing and reflecting together. So tonight we have an incredible list of speakers, Collectively, we've decided that having several speakers, each of whom has their own unique connections, stories, and relationships, is a wise way to celebrate Audrey. So we'll introduce each speaker. We've decided not to have a question and answer period or crowdsource stories for the evening because we know that would take far into next week. At the conclusion of the evening, we'll have a brief slideshow comprised of photos that you've all sent in, and that will conclude our evening. Thanks for being here tonight. And while we said earlier, we don't know the best way to do this. We do know that the best people to share this evening with are all of you. And that's why we're glad to be here together. So thank you for being here. So I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Roberta Elman is the president and founder of the Aphasia Center of California. She and Audrey have a long, rich history and friendship together. Roberta co-edited the Neurogenic Communication Disorders and Life Participation Approach text with Audrey, among many, many other collaborations. And so, Roberta, I pass the mic over to you. Thank you, Tom. I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to do a little bit of a PowerPoint because I wanted to be able to share some words and also some photos. And I have a lot packed in, so I'm probably going to be talking too quickly. So with that, let's see if I can bring up this PowerPoint and get it going. OK, so we're going to start with Audrey being born in 1933 and born in Pennsylvania. This was right, right in the middle of the Great Depression, which I hadn't kind of put together in all the years I've known her. Her father also passed away when she was very young. And when we think about Audrey, We'll think about these things. Um, Pennsylvania, as some of you here know, um, probably most of you know, is the steel state. And steel is extremely strong. It's created under great pressure. And I wanna maybe say that Audrey was born into very challenging times as well. And she became a strong woman and very resilient. And she was forged just like the toughest steel of Pennsylvania. So this is a photo from her senior high school yearbook. So this is Audrey Ann um, Holland at this point, right? And what they um, said about her, so you know in yearbooks how the staff get to say a little quip about people, and this was the quip for Audrey. An attractive girl whose conversational ability makes her popular with both sexes. And I think that was true to the very end of her life. She was a good conversationalist and could talk to anyone and everyone. Audrey was a Renaissance person. She had so many interests and talents. And if you got to know her, you found out about a lot of them. She, had, she always was interested in new ideas and perspectives. She had intellectual curiosity. She was a great cook and also loved eating out and trying new things, which I got to do quite a bit with her. She loved design, both clothing and interior design and decorating. All the arts, movies, plays, opera, TV, fine arts, football and sports, especially the Pittsburgh Steelers. Politics, she was very active and concerned and involved, as well as with social causes. She was an excellent writer and editor. 
a great listener and observer, a good mentor and counselor. She loved nature and living creatures, um, loved to travel. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And also love to read both fiction and nonfiction. We never talk about Renaissance women, always Renaissance men. So that's why I said Renaissance person. And she should be kind of the dictionary entry for that. So this is where I start my story with Audrey in 1978. And those of you who took a psychology class probably remember way back in your memory about Carl Lorenz and imprinting. And I think maybe me when it comes to Audrey. So this is a photo of Carl Lorenz and some, I think these are ducks, they might be geese, I can't really tell. But the first thing or being that, that a duck sees, it can imprint on. And in 1978, I first saw Audrey present at the ASHA convention, which was held in San Francisco that year. She happened to be on a panel of aphasia researchers. I'm not really sure how I got into that session or why I went. Um, I was a senior in college at the time. And I think I was imprinted <laughs> um, because I had never met anyone with aphasia at that time. And I hadn't even taken a course about aphasia at that time. And I hardly understood anything from Audrey's talk. I really remember thinking back now that I thought, oh my gosh, will I ever be able to understand this? But I knew enough to know that her talk was important. There was something about her participation in that panel that really impacted me. 1980, another thing that happened was that Audrey and colleagues um, thought about the cattle. So they published the cattle aphasia test, the communicative abilities in daily living. That changed so much about how we thought about what aphasia was and what it wasn't. And it assisted speech language pathologists in uncovering communication strategies. And it really impacted my thinking enormously about working with people who had aphasia and also about research questions and methods. Now we go to 1988, so we're, we're coming closer to time. And there was the Clinical Aphasiology Conference that was held in Cape Cod that year. And this is when I was first introduced to Audrey by Terry Wirtz. I kind of had a fangirl moment, I remember. Terry said, oh, this is someone you should meet. This is Audrey Holland, of course I knew her name. That was a really important conference for me and others who were interested in social and life participation approaches to aphasia. I would say we were, Birds of a Feather, and this is the conference where we started to flock together. Then in 1994, um, the University of Arizona had aphasia groups, and this is not, uh, this is a picture of the University of Aphasia, aphasia group more currently, not back in 94. Um, Audrey and Paige Beeson were providing aphasia groups at the University of Arizona and had created a videotape about aphasia groups as part of a federally funded educational series. I think I have that right. Um, whoops, let me go back. In Oakland, California, at the same time, we were getting ready to start a randomized control trial to investigate the efficacy of aphasia group treatment for people with chronic aphasia. And I reached out to Audrey and asked if I could come to observe the University of Arizona groups and also chat with her. And as always, she was incredibly gracious and said, absolutely. And we bonded then, really, in 1994, over a love of good food, good wine, and travel. And a 30-year friendship was born. Now, this is a picture, a photograph by Margie Forbes, taken in 1996. I just want to mention, Audrey was really a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. And she, you can see that she's uh, dressed in the colors of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And this is her dog at the time, Barkley. In 1996, the Pittsburgh Steelers played in the Super Bowl in Arizona and Audrey went along with some of Margie's family. And this is Audrey's dog wearing Pittsburgh Steeler glasses. You'll have to take my word for it. And uh, Audrey put those on Barkley. Um, and you learned when the Steelers were playing football, if you were a friend of Audrey, you learned never to call or make plans to do anything with her other than to watch the game. In 1998, at the Speaking Out, this was the inaugural Speaking Out conference for the, from the National Aphasia Association. It was held in Chicago. I remember I was giving a seminar in aphasia groups to speech language pathologists there. And the almost the first person I saw when I arrived in Chicago and went near the meeting room was Audrey. She was talking to two men and Audrey said to me, Roberta, you need to meet Don and Roger. And then she walked away. <laughs> I thought, uh-oh. Don and Roger both had aphasia. 
They attended groups at the University of Arizona and also ran their own aphasia group in Scottsdale, Arizona. Don told me that he knew all about aphasia groups, kind of gave me that look, and I could tell he was disappointed that he hadn't been asked to give the talk that I would be giving. Okay, so Don and Roger both decided that they were going to come to my three-hour seminar. They sat in the very first row in front of me as I was talking at the podium, and they both had poker faces. And I've never been that nervous about presenting anything ever as that three hours with them sitting right there. After the seminar was over, I kind of held my breath and they came up to me at the podium and they were smiling. That's a good sign. They told me that, they, that their groups were a lot like the groups I was talking about and um, that we became fast friends after that. And so Audrey had really connected us. She, she loved to connect people. I think it, she was a master of that. She enjoyed getting to know people with aphasia, people without aphasia, and she loved being that matchmaker. So this is a photo taken in 2001 of Audrey and me. So back in 1996, the Aphasia Center of California, we opened our doors and Audrey was incredibly supportive as she is for so many people and was, and interested in what we were doing from the very beginning. She was eager to learn more about how things were going and offered to help us in any way. And she was our keynote speaker for the Aphasia Center of California's five-year anniversary event in 2001. And this photo was taken when the event was over and we were getting ready to head out to a delicious meal. And Audrey and I had a history of that. I usually had to find the restaurant and make the reservation and then we would go. And then this is, we're jumping ahead to 2021. So this is 20, um, 15 years later from the, the previous one, 20 years later, actually 20 years later, can't do math. Audrey was still just as interested and supportive of what we were doing at the Aphasia Center of California. And this is a photo of Audrey and me chatting about aphasia services at the Aphasia Center of California's virtual 25 year celebration. And um, you can see the word pioneer. We were talking about how she was really a pioneer in all that we were doing. And I threw this in here, and this is actually a photograph by Cindy Thompson, who you'll be hearing from later, taken in 2012, just to say that Audrey loved um, the Dordogne region of France, and especially this cave, the Font de Gaume. She, um, it was very special to her, and I've, I don't know exactly how many times she was there, but I think it might take two hands to count. She visited many times. Um, this area of France really combined many of her very favorite things. It, had, it has exceptionally interesting history, good food, natural beauty, and art and cave paintings that date back thousands of years. So this was Audrey from, from 2012. Now, this is a much better picture of Audrey than me, so no vanity here. I, I actually put it in. Um, in 2015, the Audrey Holland Award of Aphasia Access was established, and it recognizes an Aphasia Access member or organization for their distinguished contribution to the life participation approach to aphasia. And Audrey and I were both on the founding board of directors of Aphasia Access. And it was my honor back in 2015 to present the very first Audrey Holland Award to Audrey in Boston at the conference. We even managed to surprise her. Don't have a photo of that. Maybe the Aphasia Access folks can, can dig and find one of those photos. But this photo was taken four years later when I received that award, the Audrey, and she was attending the conference. And this was definitely a full circle moment. Both of us were crying. She doesn't look like it. I do. Anyway. <laughs> and then in uh, 2020 and 2021, depending on the copyright date, um, we did a book together. And so I want to talk a little bit about the history of that. Audrey had the idea for a series of webinars focused on LPAA and reached out to five of us, myself and Sarah Barr and Natalie Douglas, Tom Sather and Katie Strong. And, and then Audrey suggested when we, we got done with those five webinars that um, she suggested we follow it up with a book. <laughs> that would include additional invited chapters. Audrey's goal really was to reach out to early career researchers and clinicians who had innovative clinical approaches to write the chapters. She really was mentoring and wanting people to succeed in the field. She and I spent a lot of time editing. As I said before, she knew how to write a sentence and also how to edit one. Um, I'm going to miss that skill a lot going forward. We spent a lot of time thinking about the right photograph for the cover of the book. 
And it is not an accident that the people on the cover are eating, laughing, and socializing. We look through a lot of photos to find this one. We finished editing the book just as the pandemic started. So here's a picture that was a um, lovely picture, one of my favorites, taken by Leanne Tor. And this is Audrey at her um, most recent uh, abode in Tucson, her apartment. And that apartment was filled with artwork and many treasures from the Southwest, as well as her extensive travels. I think it's a lovely picture of her. I really love this one. Um, Audrey was a master clinician. Her excellent observational skills and ability to pivot quickly in real time were natural gifts. I loved watching her communicate with people, especially those living with aphasia. These photos are from the aphasia bank videos that Audrey and Margie Forbes filmed on two visits to the Aphasia Center of California. And seeing Audrey's interactions really gave me permission to lean into a more casual style in my therapy that was most natural for me. So Audrey, when we sum it up, she was a connector. She brought so many of us together in the aphasia community and she was the glue that kept us connected. She was a person, so they were right in high school, whose conversational ability made her popular with everyone. She treasured her friends and colleagues, both near and far. She was so proud of her children and grandchildren. She loved hosting people at her home and we called it the Holland Day Inn. Her impact influence and influence to me, both personally and professionally, are really immeasurable. She had so many talents. She will be dearly missed. Um, that's the understatement of the decade or maybe the century by so many. And so many, though, will continue work that will keep her incredible legacy alive. This photograph is by Julius Friedrichsen, another lovely Audrey photo taken at her favorite restaurant in Tucson, Feast. I'm just gonna end with this closing slide that I love this quote and I just thought of her. The cutting of the gem has to be finished before you can see whether it shines. And that's Leonard Cohen's quote. And boy, is she leaving us a bright light. So thank you very much, I hope. You got to know a little more about Audrey. Thank you, Roberta, that was just wonderful. Hi everyone, my name is Maya Henry from the University of Texas at Austin. I'm the current chair of the Clinical Aphasiology Conference, and it's my pleasure to introduce our next presenter, who will be speaking on behalf of CAC. Dr. Cynthia Thompson is a Ralph and Jean Sundin Professor Emerita in Communication Science at Northwestern University. Her research is focused on linguistic impairment patterns in aphasia resulting from stroke and primary progressive aphasia, the effects of treatment primarily for sentence processing impairments, and the neurobiology of language recovery. She has known Audrey for over 45 years as a professional colleague and over the past 25 years as a very close and dear friend. Welcome, Dr. Thompson. Oh, thank you, Maya, for that introduction. I'm going to share my screen um, before I get started and play it from the beginning. Um, as Maya said, I'm going to be talking about Audrey today on behalf of Clinical Physiology Conference, um, talking about her contributions to CAC and to the profession in general. Um, this is the same picture that Roberta had. She was born in Pennsylvania in 1933, grew up in Somerset, and she graduated from high school in 1951. I'm going to sort of give a little background in terms of her academic background. She went straight out to college and got a bachelor's degree, master's degree, and PhD degrees from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, her bachelor in psychology and master's and PhD in speech pathology. Her first academic position was at Emerson College, um, where she taught um, until 1965. And then she went on to join the faculty at University of Pittsburgh, where she became tech department chair and also had appointments in psychiatry and otolaryngology. Her final stint um, in academia was at the University of Arizona, which we all know, where she was department chair um, in the Department of Speech and Hearing Sciences. And she retired in 2003 as the Regents Professor Emerita at the University of Arizona. And here are just some photos of her retirement celebration and the bottom is her outside a workshop that was done in her honor for people with aphasia and at the top was her retirement dinner um, and I think there are over a hundred of us there honoring her at the time. 
But her contributions to CAC is what I was asked to talk about. She, then there are many. Um, in terms of administration of CAC, she was program chair in 1998 and conference chair in 1999. Um, these are programs from those two years. In 1998, it was in Asheville, North Carolina. And in 1999, it was in Key West, Florida. And at the CAC 50th anniversary, the organizers of that asked all of the CAC chairs to comment about their ideas about um, CAC and Audrey wrote, even in the late seventies, when my somewhat unorthodox views of aphasia rehabilitation were viewed with suspicion, CAC's wonderful camaraderie endured that I've ensured that I felt welcome and listened to. CAC has from my first one been home-based to me. I miss you guys more than you will know. And she was also local arrangements chair for three years. Um, and Roberta reminded me that in 2001, she began the opening rece reception. For those of you who have been to the meeting, um, there didn't used to be one, but there was after Audrey who managed to get the hotel to throw it in <laughs> for free, which is typical Audrey. But here are the programs uh, fr covers from the years that she was um, local arrangements chair in Santa Fe in uh, 1990. In Santa Fe again in 2001, and I was program chair that year. And in 2013 at Tucson, um, 10 years after her retirement, she served CAC as the local arrangements chair. Um, so we really thank her for that. In addition to the administrative activities, she was very active scientifically. Uh, she presented over 40 papers from 1975 to 2014. And her first paper was, um, and their first CAC was in 1975. Um, and the title of her paper was The Effectiveness of Treatment in Aphasia. Um, and that just goes right along with what her, the, the theme of her career, or of her research all through her career. But that was also, I point out, the year that she met Tigger. And I don't know if some of you have probably read the story, Roberta shared it with some people from CAC, but Tigger was a horse that she rode um, in Santa Fe. And it turns out that some of the um, people who went to the CAC a lot, um, sort of the leaders of CAC, well, we don't know for sure, but she got she received a postcards from Tigger from all over the world, from all over the United States. And they were searching for Audrey. And we think that these people who were highly involved in CAC were the ones who actually sent the postcard. So it's a real fun story that Audrey finally wrote. In terms of her scholarly contributions to the profession, she authored over 200 research articles, books, and tests. Um, she, her main area of interest, as I already mentioned, was treatment for aphasia. And she, throughout her career, wrote summary papers about the state of the art of aphasia treatment. She talked about current trends. She talked about what we needed to do in the future. Um, recent advances and future directions in aphasia therapy was a, last one that I know of that she wrote in Brain Impairment in 2008. She also wrote or edited two books, one on aphasia treatment world perspectives, where she invited uh, aphasia treatment researchers primarily from all over the world to write about aphasia treatment in various countries. It's a wonderful book. Um, and then, as Roberta mentioned, she was very good at bringing people together. She and Nancy Hem Estabrook um, edited a book called Aphasia, Approaches to a Treatment for Aphasia that came out in 1997. And this was an outcome of a meeting that she organized that was in Cody, Montana. And she brought together, I think, 10 or 12 um, clinical physiologists um, in two houses in the middle of nowhere in Cody, Montana, where we um, stayed for three days and talked about aphasia treatment. And the outcome of that meeting um, was a compilation of chapters that each of us wrote, and she published the book. Um, what some people may not know is that her beginnings were from a behavioral standpoint, from behavioral psychology, and she was quite impairment-based. Um, her first papers had to do with applications of behavioral principles and using programmed instruction in aphasia. And this last paper, Syntactic Generalization in Aphasics as a Function of Retraining an Active Sentence, actually is what motivated my dissertation. And I didn't read it until several years later, obviously, because when I was a student, um, but it became sort of the starting point of my work in sentence processing. 
So I thank her for that. And we've talked about this so many times in terms of how far she's had come from that. But she quickly turned to, by the 80s, um, the functional communication-based assessment and treatment. And I, I believe the reason that she did this um, is that she realized as a clinician, and she, Audrey became a better and better and better clinician over the course of her career. And she, when she realized that treating the language impairment was not enough. And that's when she developed the cattle, which also um, Roberta talked about. And she had the first one in 1980, and then she had two um, versions of it, um, revisions, one in, in 1999 and one in two, 2018, um, which was not that long ago. And also it's interesting that she started writing about the efficacy of functional communication therapy for aphasic people in 1980. This was also her, one of a CAC paper, and then she subsequently published um, the meat of those papers in two papers in um, JSHD in 1992. But one thing I'll sort of segue, or go, go forward a little bit to 2005 and 2006. By that time, she really, I and I know I don't think she ever didn't believe this, that both impairment and functional treatments are, are important and necessary for people with aphasia. And she and Anna Basso, again, her organizational bringing together people skills, she, the two of them organized a meeting in Lareci, Italy, which was fabulous. And they invited, um, in, including the, the two of them and 13 other people. So there are 15 of us at this meeting in a beautiful place on a um, hillside overlooking the, the water. And it was just lovely. Anyway, the purpose of this was to discuss approaches to aphasia treatment and theories of aphasia treatment. And the result, the outcome of it was that everybody there, I think, resolved, including Audrey, that both types of approaches are necessary and important. But she also inspired a book that was written, um, edited by Nadine Martin and I and uh, Linda Worrell. And what Audrey did is from her, her cases, in her clinical cases, she just disseminated those uh, different cases to an impairment-based clinician or, and researcher or a function-based um, clinician, uh, clinician and researcher and had each of us write about how we would treat the same patient. And so she provided the, the cases and inspired the book. Um, called aphasia rehabilitation, the impairment and its consequences. And then finally, what we know most about her now is her most recent work having to do with the person with aphasia. I mean, she wrote, um, um, I just can't see that speech and language therapy is anything but a relationship centered experience. So in a relationship, you gotta know somebody. If we don't know the person, we're, we're, gonna, we're, not, we're, we're going to be ineffective. And so she started writing papers about the person with aphasia um, in 1993 and maybe even before that. And these are the ones that I found that I think are very important. Um, and of course, during this period of time, she became a life coach. And the reason that she did that is so that she could better understand how to um, serve her clients with, or people with aphasia as well as their families. And so she wrote this book, Counseling and Coaching in the Chronic Aphasia. Um, a, a book at the bottom, Counseling and Communication Disorders, a Wellness Perspective in 2007, um, as well as several papers on counseling and coaching um, and about living successfully with aphasia. I love this last paper that I listed here, Better But No Cigar, Persons with Aphasia Speak About Their Speech. It's a perfect title for a paper that Audrey wrote. Um, and then finally, and, 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 and Roberta already mentioned the, the book that, that the two of them put together on the like participate uh, approach. Um, she also was instrumental in this period of her career in aphasia groups and centers, and I'll let others talk about that. I know Paige's gonna talk about her aphasia groups at University of Arizona. In closing, I wanna share some thoughts um, from her CAC friends. <clears throat> Sorry, I um, was one of the first to learn of her death. And so being a steering committee member, I sent the announcement to people, to the steering committee. And I've got so many touching emails back from so many people. And these are just a few of them I wanna read for you. <clears throat> Leanne Gulper wrote, Audrey was such a dynamic and singular spirit. 
She touched the lives of so, so many around the world. We are all her children. Um, and Joe Duffy wrote, Audrey was quite a human being, a real force in our profession and a role model for many. She'll be missed. And I, um, Nadine Barton wrote, Audrey was a powerhouse of love and wisdom. I know the influence she had on me was shared by many. And I love this quote by Penny Myers Duffy. I'll forever picture Audrey in her signature crisp jeans, white blouse and black blazer. She taught us new ways of thinking about aphasia and about the whole person communicating in their own context in the real world. She was an independent thinker and a dear friend to many of us. One of the CAC stars twinkling now in the, in the sky. And then finally, Chick LaPointe wrote, lost a dear friend and precious person and colleague. Audrey was on the team of Harold Goodglass, um, Fred Darley, Hildred Shule and Paul Broca, I think he was talking about, but I'm not sure. She was golden. And here are just a few photos from my collection. And I know at the end of the, the celebration, we're going to run a lot of more pictures than these, but these are some of the photos of her with her friends at various CAC meetings over the years, starting in 1992. These, that's the earliest picture I have. And the last one was 2013 when she um, did the local arrangements in Tucson, Arizona for the meeting. And finally, a personal note, Audrey was not, not only made significant contributions to the profession and influenced many the lives of many uh, professionals, those with aphasia and their families. She was a dear, dear friend. We traveled together, shopped together, ate together, talked about everything from politics to books to theater and opera and sometimes work. We shared all of our stories. I loved her and miss her terribly. Thank you, Audrey, for you. You will always be in our hearts. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Um, your words are a lovely reflection on a valued colleague and friend. My name is Janet Patterson, and I am here with Paige e. Beeson, representing the Academy of Neurologic Communication Sciences and Disorders. And we'd like to continue with reflections about Audrey and her life and her work. We are grateful to join with our aphasia community in paying tribute to Audrey. Paige, who I am sure is well known to all of you, is Professor Emerita at the University of Arizona. She and Audrey were colleagues, not only in ANCDS, but also at the University of Arizona. Paige? You're muted, Paige. There you go. There we go. Thanks, Janet. I really appreciate that uh, Roberta and Cindy gave the scaffolding for the history of Audrey's career. And I'm going to focus on a particular epic. Um, Audrey came to the University of Arizona in the fall of 1991 as professor and department head of speech, language, and hearing sciences. Our department had just received uh, NIH funding for the National Center for Neurogenic Communication Disorders, and Audrey was one of the principal investigators. I had completed my PhD at Arizona the year before and was working as a research scientist for the Department of Neurology, and good fortune came when Audrey called me before she arrived in town and asked if I'd be interested in joining the center research team, and that began our collaboration. Uh, Audrey came with a vision to develop our aphasia group program. She had visited North York Aphasia Center in Toronto, and she was raring to go. Uh, Audrey often acknowledged the fact that we weren't the first to implement aphasia groups in a university setting. In fact, uh, Dan Boone had facilitated an aphasia group in our department during his tenure, and I can still picture it with 10 to 12 individuals sitting in a large circle. But Audrey wanted smaller conversation groups uh, where relationships were developed uh, as we focused on maximizing communication. So we started the first group and then second and then third and fourth. And by 1995, we had eight aphasia groups as well as a family caregiver group. We immersed ourselves in the milieu of living with aphasia. Uh, of course, we were conducting research as well in many one-on-one -on -one sessions with a particular focus on naming impairment and lexical retrieval. But week after week, as we facilitated groups, our lives were intertwined with people with aphasia 
and their care partners. The workload was shared by graduate students, PhD and masters, as well as collaboration from Nancy Hale Masterbrooks, who ultimately joined our Neurogenic Center and spent her winters in Tucson. Audrey and I co-authored a number of papers and chapters during that time, but the one that sticks in my mind uh, is one that Cindy had listed. Uh, this is one of the most meaningful to me. It was a, a short commentary published in Aphasiology in 1993 called Finding a New Sense of Self. Um, this is one of those collaborations where I've lost track of what words were Audrey's and what were mine because we shared the same view and which we had learned from our patients. Um, here's a quote from the paper. The impact of aphasia can be life-changing to the extent, extent that one sense of self is shaken and a new self image may be in the making from the first wakeful moment following the stroke. Therefore, as clinicians, we will be involved with individuals and family members as they mourn the insult to the pre-stroke identity and as they make adjustments to the sense of self. So this is so true. And always, Audrey always conveyed that it was a privilege to walk beside patients and family down the road to recovery. But the destination was not the same place that the person was before the stroke. And Audrey emphasized it's a path where our interactions should reinforce the individual self-worth as we support an often fragile self-image during the time of crisis and when we have the opportunity over the long haul. One of Audrey's beloved patients, Roger Ross, had been a highly successful international businessman before his stroke. He shared with us that life was good before his stroke and life after the stroke is different, but it's good too. Audrey knew this truth and she helped patients and families and students to understand and to embrace it. Audrey's influence has been worldwide from her papers, presentation, tests, uh, and her relational influence and collaboration with so many in the field. But when I think about her time at Arizona, I think about her influence in the tradition of Norman Geshwin, where she mentored students in the classroom, the lab, the clinical setting, who have gone on to do great things themselves, and to mentor other generations of clinicians and clinician scientists. She was a primary mentor to some and a bonus mentor to others. Um, among those that come to mind during her tenure are Laura Murray, Larry Bowles, Amy Ramage, Fabi Hirsch, Lynn Turkstra, Lisa Millman, Tammy Hopper, Nidhi Mahendra, Jessica uh, Richardson, Joris Friedrichsen, Sharon Antonucci, and Maya Henry. Of course, each of these individuals beget their own list of influential progeny who continue to influence the field. In closing, I want to share a few words um, from Audrey that were recorded on the occasion her, of her being honored as Regents Professor at the University of Arizona in 1998. So I will share my screen. It was just sort of like falling into this uh, you know, wonderland of interesting problems. Once I discovered the field, I just never thought about anything else. You're a little bit of a doctor, and you're a little bit of a linguist, and you're a little bit of a cognitive scientist, and you're certainly uh, someone who is involved in, in, in changing people's lives. I'm, I'm filled with gratitude about it. And I'm a little embarrassed about it, too, I have to say, but it, it's, uh, uh, it's really one of the very nicest things that ever happened to me, and I'm very grateful for it. And I'll hand it back to Roberta. Oh, I'm sorry, to oh, Jane. Excuse me. me. Thank you, Paige. Those are wonderful and inspiring words uh, from Audrey in her own voice. So I believe, as I'm sure many of you do as well, that in our careers, our work, and our lives, we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us, 
who built strong foundations which allow us to create new and exciting pathways, which in turn will encourage the next generation of individuals, clinicians, researchers, persons with aphasia, family and friends, to venture in even more unique and fulfilling directions. Despite her diminutive stature, Audrey Holland had very broad and very strong shoulders on which we all stand, some of which you've heard already this evening. Everyone here today, and many people who could not be here, have been touched in one way or another by Audrey, as students, colleagues, mentees, clients, and most importantly, as humans. We owe Audrey a debt of gratitude for the guiding light she has been to people living with aphasia and those of us investigating aphasia. The mission of ANCDS is to enhance the communicative lives of people affected by neurologic disorders. And its vision is to ensure that every person affected by neurogenic communication disorders receives the highest quality of clinical services. Through her life's work, Audrey embodied this mission and vision. We are all aware of the contributions to clinical research Audrey made throughout her career, beginning with her early work in program speech sound discrimination treatment for children, through investigating <laughs> impairment-based treatment for adults with neurologic communication disorders, her participation in the VA cooperative study in 1986 that paved the way for thinking about group treatment for aphasia, and the guiding force she has been in bringing aphasiologists to recognize the importance of client-centered care and collaborative goal setting. The consummate advocate, guide, and coach, she never wavered from her true north of serving people with aphasia and their families. Her publications and presentations about counseling for persons with aphasia and their families, coaching persons with aphasia, her advocacy efforts and champion activities such as meditation and yoga as important in aphasia management have been revolutionary and have become mainstream in our clinical world. Audrey has been important to the ANCDS family. She was among the first to become a member of the Academy and has delivered presentations to the annual scientific and educational meeting. In 1995, she was awarded the honors of ANCDS which recognizes members who have made outstanding contributions to research, teaching, treatment, and service in the area of neurologic communication disorders. Audrey held high standards for herself and others as they guide people with aphasia and provide clinical service. She exemplified this in ANCDS through her work developing and co-chairing with Joe Duffy the ANCDS Board of Clinical Certification from 1994 to 1998. The ANCDS Board of Clinical Certification recognizes the advanced and stringent clinical study activities an individual completes in order to be awarded ANCDS BCC. The goal of this program, consistent with the goals espoused by Audrey in her career, is to maintain high standards of practice in serving persons with neurogenic communications disorders and their families. Her pioneering efforts in this area have been sustained to this day in the current work of the BCC. Speaking for the ANCDS members, we are grateful to have had Audrey as part of this organization and to have been part of her life. The True North guidance she exemplified will burn brightly within ANCDS and within each of us for years to come. It is my pleasure now to introduce Maura Silverman, representing the National Aphasia Association. Maura? Thank you, Janet. What an honor to be able to, first of all, sit in Darlene's spot tonight. Unfortunately, Darlene is not feeling well and could not attend today, and to sit amongst so many of the people that interacted with Audrey throughout her life as both colleagues and friends. I think it's interesting the timing and the information that Darlene asked me to share because the NAA as set up by all of the previous speakers is to provide education, research and support. And those things were so important to Audrey. 
as I've been listening to people over the last week and three days of my job with the NAA, I have heard things like, the NAA holds a special place in my heart. That's Audrey. That it is a beacon or a lighthouse. That also is Audrey. When I asked Arlene if I could help since she wasn't feeling well, she sent me some words. She said, she took little nobodies like me and made us feel important and that our contribution to the aphasia world counted and representing all people with aphasia. She gave us permission to step outside of the medical model and to listen to what people with aphasia want and what they need. Very appropriate and set up well, again, by the previous speakers. One of the interesting timing situations here too is that as I think about my interactions with Audrey, it's very similar to what Darlene experienced, which is, you're talking to me? I think we all have recognized when that phone rang or an email came and it said, Audrey Holland, that you took that little breath of like, I think she must have the wrong number. She can't be possibly talking to me. But during their aphasia bank, Margie and um, Audrey came to the Triangle Aphasia Project during my tenure there, but not to see the Triangle Aphasia Project and get samples just from people there, but also to interview my mom who suffered a massive stroke in 2009. That interaction that my Audrey had with my mom is imprinted, similar to your story, Roberta, in my heart. My mom shared things, talked and communicated in a way that she hadn't since her stroke and connected immediately with Audrey um, in her head and in her heart. Before I accepted the position to the National Aphasia Association, I kept calling Audrey, called her multiple times. One time I got her, heard her in the background talking, but she left the phone on. So I was like, can you hear me? Can you hear me now, Audrey? <laughs> Please pick up the phone for probably a good five minutes. Um, then I hung up and I never was able to speak to her again. She had um, then died several days later actually on the day that I accepted my position to the NA. When I was unable to reach her and when I finished up at TAP, a dear friend of mine and of Audrey's actually, Marianne Eller, came to a little gathering to say goodbye, um, to thank you know the TAP family as I left it. And she shared something that I think you all have heard Audrey tell this story, but she had painted something for me. And it was the starfish story. And if you haven't re read it, I am not going to read it for you, um, the whole thing, but please look it up because at the end, it talks about it made a difference to that one that she helped. And so I think that talking about how Audrey impacted the NAA is very similar to how she impacted us as professionals. She didn't see anybody as a nobody. She saw everybody as a somebody. And in this, I am forever grateful. And it was so beautiful to hear her voice. So thank you for that as well. Um, I have an honor as um, we talk about how she impacted people with aphasia in their lives is to share and introduce a person who was special to, to Audrey. Eileen Erickson is the wife of a stroke survivor with a long and close relationship to Audrey. Eileen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Mara. Audrey Holland was a world-renowned researcher, lecturer, and counselor for those affected by aphasia. To me, she was all of those and a supportive friend. I met Audrey in 2005 my late husband, Paul, and I were very active at the Adler Aphasia Center in New Jersey. Orgy was on the board and well-known in the research world. 
When Paul and I moved to Tucson, Arizona in 2007, there was Audrey, and she introduced us to Fabi Hirsch Cruz. We all worked together to start an aphasia center in Tucson. Today, that center is known as Friends of Aphasia. Under Fabi's leadership, it has grown and is a thriving center for people affected by aphasia. What I value most in my relationship with Audrey is the friendship that she gave to me and Paul. She spent a lot of time with Paul, helping him adjust to life with aphasia. She knew just how to pinpoint the perfect practical advice. After working with Paul for several weeks, she said to me, Paul needs to take the special bus to the aphasia center by himself. Well, that was easy to put into place. Then she said, and he needs a dog. That was not quite so easy for me to accept because I did not see myself walking down the street holding a fistful of plastic baggies. But Audrey said, you won't do that, Paul will. Right, she knew. She was also the facilitator at our caregiver groups in Tucson. The small group of women were really struggling, trying to find insights and ways to cope with the impact of aphasia on their loved one and on their life. At our first meeting, Audrey really surprised me. Rather than laying out all the, the time-worn mantras for how to be a good caregiver, she asked each one of us to describe an experience where we showed courage. Courage, like in a fist fight or a war battle. I never had to fight for my life. But describe we did a whole range of courage stories, from performing a solo audition to join a chorus, to smuggling um, asylum-seeking immigrants across the Arizona Mexico border. As each of us spoke, the others just kind of nodded in recognition. And then Audrey, sitting there, smiling knowingly, said, you can do this. We all left that meeting standing taller, cloaked in our newly recovered courage. As my friendship with Audrey developed, I called her little A. I kind of think she likes that. She passed on a CD of doo music to me, knowing that I really liked that genre, and she definitely did not. We celebrated birthdays together, but she never revealed her age. However, earlier this summer, my friend Christina and I took Audrey out for a birthday lunch, and it was there that she took out her driver's license, and she said, I'm going to be 90. And so... Another page has turned in the book of life for Audrey. I will always cherish my Audrey chapter. Thank, Thank you. you, Eileen. Thank you for sharing. That was You're beautiful. Welcome. I have the opportunity and honor to introduce another one of Audrey's mentees and friends colleague, bra league. Sharon Antonucci is representing the Academy of Aphasia. She is a clinical researcher in aphasia and aphasia rehabilitation. She received her PhD at the University of Arizona in 2005 and is director of the Moss Rehab Aphasia Center. It's all you. Hi, thank you. I was very, very grateful to be included tonight. And I, listening to everyone and listening to how everything is flowing and, and our stories connect from one to the next really makes me feel like Audrey is here with us. Um, Maura mentioned emails from Audrey and I actually still have the very first email I ever received from Audrey. Um, it was back in May of 2001, and she was actually emailing to tell me that she could not be my PhD mentor because she was moving toward retirement, um, but she was still in the department. She was still 
of course, working in the aphasia research project. And I had the opportunity to work with her on my qualifying committee and later on my prelim and dissertation committees. But how Audrey and I really bonded is that I became her go-to dog sitter for her beloved dog, Bob. Um, <clears throat> and this was a time when Audrey was doing a lot of traveling, including when she went to Christchurch. So I spent a lot of time with Bob. Um, and of course, I was immediately besotted with him and came to think of myself and Audrey and I bonded um, as his, his dual moms, his mom and his mom when his real mom was away from home. And so I was so fortunate to be able to spend so many evenings around Audrey's dining table or in her living room, um, just chatting about all every topic you could imagine. Um, but no matter how much time I spent with her, I never lost that, that slight sense of awe that I had, that I was sitting and talking to the capital T-H-E, Audrey Holland her vivacity, her intelligence, her creativity, and just her stamina um, and love of life were larger than life. And it wasn't until I had known her for many years um, and I was standing next to her at some event in my high heels that I'm always wearing. And I realized how petite she was. I had always thought of her as just being enormous. She had had such an enormous presence and I was kind of struck by how petite she really was. Um, and I, I also remember when, um, it must have been my first year at the U of A, um, so this was back again in the early 2000s. So Audrey would have been, I think in her late 60s at that point. And she walked into the office that I was sharing with Maria Munoz, who was her postdoc at the time. And I can't remember why this came up, but she said, you know, it's only in the past year or so that I really understand what people mean when they say they're tired. She just <laughs> had so much energy um, and just so, always so many things going on that she just kind of never experienced being tired. Meanwhile, I was in my 20s and all I could think was, geez, I could really use a nap. Um, so she was just an inspiration in every sense of the word. Um, but kind of as towering as that image of her was and still is, it really was the combination of her honesty and her genuine caring and her real kind of deep generosity of spirit, I think, that made Audrey unique. And the, as a mentor, the amount of support that she gave was absolutely incredible. And it was also no nonsense. Um, if she had a critique, you were gonna hear about it and you were gonna hear about it in, in no uncertain terms. Um, I remember <clears throat> when I was getting feedback on my dissertation and this was for the youngsters in the crowd, this was back when you actually printed out your dissertation and people wrote you comments and in, in handwriting. Um, my primary mentor was Paigey and Paigey would give me these beautiful line edits in her extremely fabulous penmanship. And then I would get some, I would get comments back from Audrey and there would just be a, a whole page that just had one big question mark on it. No comment, no line edit, just a big question mark. And I thought, okay, well, either I haven't, I haven't made my argument clear to Audrey or she thinks my argument is a big, so what? So I better go back and, <laughs> and fix this. Um, I just have so many memories I'm so grateful for of, of Audrey. But I think if I had to single out one, I'd say the greatest gift that she gave me um, and this includes the donation that she made toward my graduation gift to myself, which was a pair of Manolo Blahniks, which she was very excited about, um, is that she really gave just unwavering 
support in terms of confidence, in terms of enthusiasm, um, in terms of expertise. Um, for my belief in the power of the human non-human animal bond to impact aphasia recovery and just to make life better. And it was because of conversations that I had with Audrey and an amazing weekend that I spent with Audrey and Myrna Schwartz back, I think in 2018, that led to us getting what I think is the very first NIH funded study for animal assisted research for people with aphasia. So Audrey, Audrey's legacy will, will live on for, for all of us, um, including not only ourselves, but our animals. Um, and so for what I'm going to share, <clears throat> as I think is probably often the case for those of us who consider ourselves animal people, um, I don't have too many photos of Audrey and myself. I don't know if I actually have any photos of Audrey and myself. So I wanted to share this photo of Audrey, which is my all time favorite. And thank you, Paigey, for finding it for me. Uh, this photo was always in her home. Audrey's home was full of, of art and photographs. And this one was always front and center. And it was my all time favorite photo of her. And these are some photos of our beloved Bob. And so Audrey, I know you're here and I know you're listening. So please give sweet Bob a big hug and a kiss from me. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. That was wonderful, wonderful uh, recollections and wonderful pictures as well. And certainly lots to appreciate with the animals who certainly are human. So thanks. Uh, great, great stories and great uh, recollections. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Um, and our next speaker will be joining us from Florida. Dr. Jackie Hinckley is a professor and director of the Speech Language Communication Disorders Program at Nova Southeastern. She's also on the board of directors of the National Aphasia Association and Aphasia Access, a fellow in person-centered care and board certified in neurogenic communication disorders. And like Audrey, she forwards the profession through her mentorship and support of early, mid-career, and beyond professionals. And I can attest to that on multiple times and evidenced by the little flamingo relic that I have hanging on my, my bookshelf that she shared with me in a time that I greatly needed some support and certainly appreciated. So it's my pleasure to introduce Jackie Hinckley. Thank you, Tom, for the very touching and generous introduction. I appreciate that. Um, I'm very humbled to um, have an opportunity to speak at this event today and to honor Audrey. Um, it's hard to know where to start to describe her legacy or her effects on me and on us all. But I guess I'll begin with a story that starts with the development of the Communicative Abilities and Daily Living Test in 1980, which was mentioned previously, a test that involved role playing and making observations about what a person with aphasia would do in different situations. Around that time in 1982, Audrey presented a paper at the Clinical Aphasiology Conference entitled Remarks on Observing Aphasic People. In that paper, she provided four recommendations. The first one was talk to the family. They know who the person is and has been. The second one was observe the person with aphasia interacting with at least one other person besides yourself. Third, observe the person with aphasia in at least one other environment. And the fourth one, I had to leave in exactly her words. I'm not sure I need to mention this, but if there's anybody here who hasn't tried it, I would be remiss if I failed to bring it up. Try talking to your patients instead of working on their language problem. Now, it wouldn't be one of Audrey's presentations if there wasn't a story along with it too. So the story that she told during that paper goes like this. She said, 
There was a quiet, agrammatic, tremulous woman who took up space in one of our aphasia groups, speaking only when spoken to, tentatively, and usually with her anomia very apparent. Volunteering information was not her style. I was scheduled for an afternoon session at her house, which I approached with apprehension, not knowing how we were going to make it alone for three hours. By the time I got off the streetcar, where I was surprised to find her waiting for me, I knew it what I was in for anything but what I had anticipated. She told me that we were getting right back on the streetcar, going downtown and having lunch, then shopping. When we returned three hours later with all of her new clothes, I was comfortable with my role, assigned by her as chief culprit, defender, and explainer to her husband for her shopping spree. Through it all, she was agrammatic, anomic, non-fluent, but she ordered lunch. She pointed out flaws in clothes that I hadn't noticed. She was about in as much need of the kid glove treatment the clinic was giving her as Han Solo from Star Wars would be. While this story showed us how to know people with aphasia as people, it also tells us a lot about who Audrey was as a person, how she kept a not knowing stance with people and was willing to find out things that she might have otherwise assumed she knew. To me, this is a hallmark of her entire career. Every study, every grant, every publication, every interaction began with the assumption that she didn't know this person or their experiences. She always assumed that she did not know exactly this person's aphasia, what it meant to them or how it intersected with the complexities of their personality and their unique life. It's so easy for us to feel that we have so much experience and that this person here is probably a lot like the person over here that we met before. And yet Audrey didn't do that. How did she do that? And I'm not just talking about people with aphasia and their families. I mean, all of us. She approached each one of us as a whole person. She did not limit her knowledge of me or of any one of us to our professional personas, what we were like as clinicians or researchers. She knew who was a writer of beautiful poems or going through a divorce or who, or who had recently fallen in love. One day when she was, I think around 80 or so, she was telling me about how she wanted to go see the polar bears and how she didn't care if she slipped off the glacier, she was going to try to go see those bears. I told her that I could understand that. When I was out in the ocean on a small boat with just my husband, um, I thought that if things went wrong, at least it would make a fabulous story. Audrey replied with, you and I have a lot in common. Audrey had a lot in common with everyone. She had a magical power to see the whole person, find the common link and connect those links across people. She drew people to her and along with her, like a benevolent tidal wave. Thinking about those four previous points from 1982, which were here, we could also think of them as remarks on getting to know people. Good guidelines for a positive life that changes people. I don't know if I would have truly learned those lessons without Audrey. In closing, I'd like to share my personal feelings and I suppose many of you might share, with, share these with me. But Audrey's faith and confidence in me changed my own self-confidence and enabled me to do things that I would have never attempted had it not been for her love and support. It's safe to say that I would be a different person and my career wouldn't be the same without the whole person of Audrey Holland talking to and observing me. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Jackie. Um, that was wow. I, you took me through the roller coaster of emotions because I was laughing and almost fell out of my chair. And then um, you really brought it home with some very touching words. So thank you so much, Jackie. That was beautiful. Um, it's my. Uh, I'm Sarah Wallace. I'm um, the vice president for Aphasia Access. And it's my pleasure to introduce our final scheduled speaker for the evening. Um, Dr. Davida Fromm is a faculty researcher at Carnegie Mellon University, just down the street from me. And I'm um, fortunate to get to call Davida a friend and neighbor. And she's here to share um, as one of Audrey's um, dear friends and colleagues, um, she's here to share um, some words from Audrey to kind of wrap up the evening. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm so honored to read some of Audrey's work. What a joy it was to dive back into 50 plus years of her publications that have been well reviewed tonight. And seriously, when you're missing Audrey and need a fix, reread one of her articles. Her unique voice, her profound wisdom and humanity and humility and humor come through loud and clear. So in Audrey's words, let me share. From her 2005 paper entitled Recovered Memories, My Life as a Skinnerian. In retrospect, I think my operant swan song was sung as a result of a study published in 1974 with my colleague Judith Sonderman. In that work, we taught token test-like commands to individuals with aphasia using a hot-off-the-press errorless learning procedure. Our approach effectively, if boringly, taught our subjects to process the command but we failed to find a single measure to which the training generalized. My disillusionment went something like this. How often in any single day does anybody have to respond to a request such as, pick up the small pink peppermint and the large chocolate Oreo? Not even a please. Or, if there is a meowing cat, put the garbage pail next to the sliced tomato. If that's what this training is good for, forget it. Generalization of treatment effects to meaningful environments is not only the hard stuff, I have always seen it as the only stuff. The next paragraph is from the book that Audrey and Roberta Elman recently edited that's been mentioned. Audrey's chapter is called The Social Imperative for Aphasia Rehabilitation. I finally began to work with my first aphasic client. This would have been in Boston in the 1960s. MS was a young graduate student when he incurred aphasia as a result of an AVM bleed. He was bright, eager, and optimistic about working hard to bring about his recovery. We slogged through a whole lot of behavioral training and MS certainly improved. But somehow my role seemed more related to my counseling background than to my stimulus response skills. I was far more interested in how his changed career plans, his negotiations through life and his marriage were influenced by his aphasia. I just didn't know what to do about any of it except to listen and to counsel and make tentative suggestions for him to try out. I don't quite know how I helped, but he survived me. MS went on to become a successful marriage counselor with a solid clinical reputation, and at least my treatment caused no long-term harm. This is a short, powerful paragraph on the therapy process from Audrey's 2004 article with Amy Ramage entitled, Learning from Roger Ross, A Clinical Journey. Focus on symptoms, either cognitive or linguistic, should never be at the cost of the goals of maximizing personal control and reestablishing autonomy and a sense of self. Therapy should work towards enabling choice, respecting dignity, preserving continuity, and enabling social interaction and enjoyment of activities. 
Because Audrey believed so fervently in learning, I thought we could all learn or relearn six practical tips on the art of listening from her 2012 article called Counseling Around the Edges of Traditional Treatment. One, when you're involved in a meaningful and important conversation, practice applying a three to five second delay between the end of the person's comments and your response. Use the time to consider a few alternative responses and choose the one you consider best for your reply. Two, in those conversations, make an effort to understand your partner's point of view before offering your own. Three, if you're not sure that you have it right, ask for clarification before responding and then repeat the five second rule. Four, remember that many messages have both manifest and latent content. Make sure you try to hear both. Five, involve your body in the act of listening. Look, lean in, and don't assume a confrontational posture. The more you look like you're listening, the more likely you are to be listening. And six, remember the power of silence. There is no such thing as just listening. Sometimes silence is its own therapy, permitting the speaker to hear him or herself. A pat on the hand doesn't hurt either. And a final paragraph from the social imperative chapter. I am basically a happy person. I have always loved my work in research and in interacting with resilient, brave people and families with aphasia. But I think that after family, including my animals, what has contributed most consistently to my personal happiness has been fellowship with like-minded professionals who always seem to be there for me the joy of teaching, my research buddies and collaborators, my wonderful students, and again, the people with aphasia and their families. Students, many collaborators, families, and people with aphasia, they have in large measure made my life complete. Thank you all. And with that, we'll now shift to the slideshow that will run for about the next four minutes.
On behalf of all of the organizations that were involved tonight, on behalf of all of the speakers, this has been an incredible evening recognizing an incredible lady and also recognizing all the great work that's come and all the great work that's ahead of us. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of this evening and thank you for sharing your reflections and this community. Have a great night.